Wow, 12, 12 30. Jeez. Um, <laughs> so, hey, well, thanks for pointing that out. I've really got to pay attention better to my, uh, <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, I'll, I'll do that. I'll just have to figure out a way to, to contact her. <laughs> Hey, you're you're one of the few people that actually gets on here and interacts. So hey, I I don't want to burn that bridge. But yeah, so I was just <laughs> I was just talking about um, one of our the product that we designed, and I was talking about game design as far as analog table games. And my idea was I'm talking about the X case as a as a, an example of how to develop an idea from what you want, what you would like to see into something that might someday be an actual product like our uh, Mage Cage did. And so I do appreciate your chiming in there, but I, now that I've been talking for, let's see, uh, 15, 20 minutes, <laughs> I didn't even realize I was muted. This is the problem to streaming to, uh, to one, yeah, no kidding, to, to no viewers or to no uh, interactive viewers. They don't, nobody seems to have anything to say. So, but eventually I'll have this down and I'll be paying better. I'll be able to, you know, I'll know exactly when I'm doing something wrong right out the gate, but I'm just getting going on this stuff. So anyway, with the uh, X case, I just wanted, or the Mage cage, I was just talking about how the original design was about um, creating uh, a place to put my hero clicks, because that's where I came up with the idea for this case. And the hero clicks would would snap in underneath these these ribs underneath here, and that would allow you to get to them no matter where they were and maximize what you can put inside of the case. So once I came up with the idea to do that, I was like, okay, well, I know I'm gonna outgrow this case, so now I need to come up with a way to to carry or to get more of them. So I wanted them to all interact. So I said, well, let's connect them top to bottom. So I started coming up with ideas on how to make the cases connect vertically as well as horizontally so that you can stack them. And then I thought, well, um, we gotta go further than that. I want them to connect back to back and front to front if possible so that we can create boxes out any shape and size that you're willing to carry around at the most efficient prop possible. Because obviously if you stack these up, they can get pretty tall and it becomes impractical So I, you can go to a miniatures tournament, Hero Clicks, or or uh, any other type of tournament of that sort, and people would have hundreds of their miniatures with them, and it was just a matter of coming up with a way to carry them around. So this is just three of the units stacked up, but I'd see people with enough units to fill up ten, 10 of these cases, and. Carrying a stack of 10 would be, you know, you'd be, you'd be walking around with it up to your shoulders and dragging on the floor. So they have to connect back to back. Even that was five stack. But now if you wanted to go a little bit smaller, you can carry eight or 12 if you were willing to, if they can connect front to front. So my original design actually had them connecting like an accordion. Um, in a more advanced state, we'll talk a little bit more later of how that had to change in order to actually make them producible but that's like detail thoughts for later but ultimately it comes down to trying to think of the little things and coming up with ways to uh, make your game whatever it is just in this case our cases fit as much as you can into it while still being able to produce it financially get a price point that people will buy it at but also serve their needs now and in the future that goes for board games. Granted, you uh, CCGs try to do it by people want change. They don't want to have to keep playing the same cards over and over. If there was, if there's a thousand cards in the game, the top two hundred cards are going to be the cards everybody wants, with a few variations here and there. But they're always going to want to have those cards. If you don't change up the game in some way, it's going to get stale. All those old cards are still going to be nobody's going to want them and only those top 200 are going to have any value people are going to get bored with the game so ccgs do it by just keep giving you new cards eventually they'll retire the old cards and that you'll just keep getting new and fresh and you'll have to kind of recreate as you go board games their their approach is a little bit different so obviously they have to be fixed right i mean you're they can have expansions that can add to them but ultimately 
they have a limited amount of capacity for change. So the game itself has to produce change by way of interacting with other people at the table. So maybe your strategy today is to go for all of the wheat in a game. Replayability, exactly. So when you want to have uh, a game designed so that you can keep replaying it or that people want to replay it, I mean, there's games like um, Yahtzee or, or, or uh, um, Checkers or games like those which don't have a lot of change. I mean, there's different strategies to go about it, but the game looks the same all the time, right? So if you go for wheat and you build up everything that uses wheat in a game, for example, if it's an agriculture type game, your game board is going to look different. You're going to be building different things, doing different things. It's going to have a visual appeal that changes to you. Um, and then, but if somebody else says, hey, he's winning with this, right? Chess, chess and Munchkin are good examples of games that pretty much look the same all the time. Chess is a little bit different because at least you have different figures and different strategies have different things on the board, but it is only an eight by eight board and it's visually not going to change much. Now there's a lot of depth in that, but that's a whole different, different strategy. It's a, it's more about the thinking and the interaction with your mind, but you're not going to get the general public to come in and just start loving chess. If you want to sit down a bunch of people in front of a chessboard, only 10 of them are going to leave there going, I want to play that again. I mean, chess has got a huge following in the world, but it's pretty small compared to when you're trying to get something new into the market these days. Chess probably wouldn't do very well if it was just created in, in modern modern day game gaming world because it just doesn't have enough appeal to the new people out there. There's a lot of people who want to get into games. There are plenty of abstract games that come out and do okay, but even the ones that are good um, seldom ever reach you know, the pinnacle of, of success because they don't have enough visual appeal or, or replayability to people who want to see something different. And they want to see games that allow for a new guy to be able to compete with the old guy or the, uh, not only say old guy, the experienced guy. Okay, so it's really difficult. There's a lot of things you have to consider when you're designing a game. But the first place you need to come up with is the idea, you know, the niche, the thing that you want to fill, that hole. And you believe, and there's a lot of people out there who make the mistake of coming up with a game that is already served by the games already out there. If you want to be successful in game design, you have to come up with stuff that is poorly served in the market, not served in the market, or needs more, it's, it's not served enough, okay? So there may be a couple of good games out there that say, um, well, well, we'll use a game that we already know that there is a million games for nowadays, but there was Catan at what time, right? Uh, Settlers of Catan came out and it was, it was the game when it came out. It was new. It was fresh. Nobody had done anything, cons you know, all that close to it. And it was a huge hit. Well, now there's probably two dozen games out there that are pretty decent agriculture games that do something similar that maybe don't have quite as much uh, competitiveness as Catan. People sometimes don't like that competitiveness. I like it personally. I like talking to people. I like strategizing to try to beat people to the to the cutoff points. I mean, that's that's in my mind. And that's why so many games are are good for so many different people. Um, I don't play much Catan anymore, mostly just because I think we burned ourselves out on it way back when. But you want the trick with game design is coming up with a way to not only make the game change, but also to fill a niche that people want to fill. Um, one of the niche ideas that I don't think has been filled very well is uh, American football. I can't say football because I have people who are from all everywhere else in the world who might watch this video and most of them think that's soccer. <laughs> so, and uh, so I'll say American football, which of course is the real football in my mind because, you know, I'm American. But, um, I don't think that niche is served very well. There's been a lot of games that try to fill the niche, but most of them I don't think really capture what football is. I mean, the the full scope of what a game entails. Uh, a lot of them have tried to do, and, and there's a lot of reason for that. One, when you actually break it down, there's a lot of complexities 
into how football, or I think any sport for that matter, has a lot of complexities if you really want to get a realistic feel of the game. I mean, even soccer and baseball, they all have a lot of things going on that that's what makes them fun. But when you put them into a board game, people want to play these games and get them done in 30 minutes, 40 minutes, and go play another game. Well, a football game, a baseball game, a soccer game, none of them take 30, 40 minutes to play. So football, uh, American football is an hour long in clock time. But it's three hours long in real time because by the time you put all the breaks into a game and whatever else. So how do you capture what a football game is, keep it interesting for the, for the full length of a game? Nobody wants to sit down and play a two-player game for three hours. It just seems to be, I mean, chess can reach that long, but only the people at the highest ep et echelons of, of tournament play are going to get into a game that each player gets 90 minutes, and, you know, get an hour and a half to three hours to play. So you're not, you just don't have that many competitive people who are willing to get into a game that long. Um, so you have to be able to figure out a way to make the game approachable by the people you want to play it. Are the football fans out there who want a realistic game uh, willing to s sit and play for an hour? That would probably be reasonable. I think a lot of the gamers out there who might like football um, might sit and play for an hour, but you gotta be able to capture it. So there's a, uh, I think, third or fourth and goal, uh, pizza box football, there's a number of uh, football games out there that try to capture football's essence by only dealing with the big plays or um, trying to capture just the scoring plays. And a lot of those just don't feel like a, a real game, the grind that comes from progressing down the field. I mean, they're trying to beat that so that you will get it done in a short time. but those games kind of disappear. I mean, you hear about them saying, ah, that's probably the best football game out there, whichever one of the day is. But few people who have played them stick to them because I think they just lose interest. It could be because there's not a lot of people out there playing them, and maybe that's because it's just not meeting that football niche. Um, I've known that there's been a few baseball games out there that have done pretty well and have been able to be replicated or create a feel that's close enough that has, has been able to generate um, a fair following. There's a game called, um, I think it's uh, Baseball baseball Highlights 2045 or something like that. It's kind of a futuristic cross for baseball. And uh, I've played it, it's a, it's a pretty fun game. And the people who created it put a lot of thought into that game. It captures a pretty good feel of what baseball is. You know, the, the moving around the bases and home and hitting uh, home runs, but they add a lot of extra stuff to give it a little bit more, I don't know, uh, flavor, I guess, as you go. A little bit more strategy because now you have, their idea is it's all fantasy, so are, are um, let's see, made up. So there's, it's not based on any kind of real mechanics of baseball. It's more just based on the, the figure, or the, the cards and their abilities um, and how you interact those into the game. So you might build your deck to, uh, to adjust for those different things. So it was a fun game and it captures a good feel of baseball, but it still did not take you through an actual baseball game. Um, so sports are, are a difficult one to come up with. I, my thought is, um, I actually designed a football game and personally, I think it's actually pretty cool, but the biggest problem it currently has is time length. Um, it plays a lot like real football. Um, it uses real player stats and real real mechanics to try to generate that feel of the game, and it does a pretty good job of it in all of my playtesting with friends. It's just that um, it actually has similar lengths, different, uh, different uh, same amount of plays, same kind of scoring. You actually get to use uh, players that represent real players, although I have to design it without uh, real names and stuff because um, of licensing and all that other junk. So it's going to be kind of a generic game when it finally gets released. But I think people, the way I'm setting it up is with a little bit of research, people can figure out who each player is because it's all based on real people. 
And you can actually buy those same players in a different set, say coming years, and they'll have different stats because it's based on stats for the next year. So what's nice about it is that allows all the players to always be usable. So you'll never have to retire cards because they're based on reality. So if all of the stats have a max cap, which means nobody can hit that cap, but you, you put everybody within that range, no matter what you come out with is always a valid card because it's based on the stats of those players. So everything that they do, if they caught a ton of passes, they probably didn't run as many plays so or run as many times. So it works out pretty well. We have, I have some pretty complicated spreadsheets and such that help calculate all of the balancing. But um, it's a game that I'm looking forward to try to get out, but because of play length right now, I'm not quite ready to to get to that point. So that and graphic design. I am not a graphic design artist. Um, so once you have an idea, <laughs> once you, right? What's what do you mean? I'm not graphic design. You know that. <laughs> anyway, um, so after you come up with an idea. Oh, okay. So I'm, uh, when you come up with an idea, that's the first thing. You know what you want to you appeal to. You want to appeal to a certain type of game. This is something you don't think exists. A niche. Yeah, you know, a lot of people have. But a lot of times they just don't know where to start. You know, they, coming up with game, games, is, it's a fun idea to come up with something. Uh, a friend of mine and I, when we were... 15 or so actually sat down and said We're, let's build a game and we both created two games his I don't think he ever actually put his together I created up I came up with one that's called all the king's men and you know strangely enough I think I actually have that prototype still lying around I'll have to bring it out another time. I didn't. I, w I wasn't prepared to show it, but it's basically a simple game that I came up with that uh, has four castles, and your goal is to take over the other three, so you can play with four people. And in doing so, you're traveling around the board, and you're conquering uh, different board, what I call board enemies or board uh, challenges along the way, and you're building this army. So as you defeat people, defeat uh, these creatures on the board you your army starts to grow and then eventually when you think you're ready you attack one of the other castles on the board and you try to take their castles and uh it was pretty it was a pretty fun little game it played pretty well um not bad for a first try i guess it was never anything that was published or got to that point of being ready to be published but i did have a game board and i had the the pieces all set up and the dice working together You know, um, roguelikes are actually a pretty cool idea in general. I mean, a lot of people have, uh, you know, see a, see a video game and they're like, hey, you know, this would be cool if we could do this as a board game. And there's been a few attempts at it. Uh, a couple of deck builders that have tried to do stuff like that. Um, I don't know. I, the, what's uh, one game, uh, game that I've seen that uh, I actually own? Um, dang it. I should probably write down some of these games before I start sitting down at the, the screen. But it actually allows you to build your 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 character up, and you build a little uh, party of characters. You can add them to your party, and then you go fight guys in a dungeon. And that's kind of its its premise. It's pr pretty simple, but the execution of it, as popular as the game is, is it can be a little complicated for a board game. And this is one of the things with board games that get to be to have a lot of options. They also have a lot of pieces and a lot of setup and a lot of teardown. And there's a good balance that you have to consider when you're building games to uh, get a good set of, if I'm going to play this game for an hour or two hours or whatever it is, um, I don't want to be putting it up for an hour and taking it down for an hour. You know, I want to be able to get into it as quickly as possible, do my thing, and then tear it down pretty quick. Um, Gloomhaven is kind of a 
kind of along those lines. It's an adventure game that people really like. It's pretty high up. If you go to like Board Game Geek, you can check out uh, uh, Gloomhaven, and they came out with I think Frosthaven. They just uh, put up on Kickstarter a few months back, and that's going to be coming out pretty soon, which is like the second wave of that. Um, they're cool games. I've I had I actually own Gloomhaven, and I did back Frosthaven. <laughs> I sadly have not got a chance to play them yet. Um, I'm one of those people who's kind of stubborn with games that have miniatures in them. I want to paint them before I start playing. Or at least paint one or two of the ones I'm going to be using. <laughs> but uh, I also got to get get a chance to sit down with friends and family and start playing these games. Uh, COVID making that really difficult right now. So I have to wait before we can do that. I've heard of a few people playing Gloomhaven over Zoom, though. So I may have to try that if this goes on too long. Um, what uh, there's also one um, I think one of the deck builder ones that people ca that that came out with uh, I think was based on uh, not D and D but uh, uh, there's another uh, uh, RPG out there that's not uh, there mm, can't remember the name but they ha that company that created this I don't know we'll call it D and D competitor. Uh, created a deck building game that's a cool concept I've never played it but what the premise is is you build your deck as you go and when you're done for the day you can just put your deck away and when you go come back the next time you bring that deck with you and you play and it'll change and grow as you go um, I liked that idea and I actually purposefully did not buy that game because I was in the middle of designing a similar kind of game where my deck builds my character and you could technically come back to the game with that same deck and play with it again the next time you play and grow and make it stronger and better each time based on the stuff you find and the training you go through I have heard of Slay the Spire that's um isn't that the uh, is that the miniatures game or is that a different uh, a different one I'm thinking of Oh, video game, right? Okay, what was the one? Uh, Warhammer came out with one that was something like, had a similar title. But uh, no, I have not played Slay the Spire, but I've heard of it. Is, and is that, that's a roguelike, I presume. I've played a f quite a few of the different uh, roguelikes out there. Um, I actually have been looking into uh, Hades, I guess. It's supposed to be a pretty good one. People say that that's pretty fun. Um, Turn-based RPGs are always uh, fun to me because I don't have to pay as much attention. <laughs> I like games when I can get distracted and, you know, my wife calls me or my kids call me and I can walk away and not have to worry about being pummeled while I'm gone or... I don't have to try to say, hey, wait, wait till I get to town or run back to wherever. Um, so I do have uh, I do have those kind of games as one of the top on my list. I play a lot of that stuff. Oh, okay. I think I now I think I know which one you're talking about. The card, the one that uses uh, the more cards you get, you can those are your attacks or the things you do. You pick the cards. Yeah, I think I saw that one on Steam. And uh, I am familiar with that, yeah. And I think that's that's one I think came from RPR CS CCGs. That was a video game that somebody goes, hey, you know, CCG, let's let's convert that to a video game. And I always thought Magic needed to take that approach. I haven't seen the new uh, uh, Magic uh, Magic Arena, the old uh, Magic Online. I thought kind of missed an opportunity with graphics and stuff. They literally made it Magic. On a t on line, I always thought, well, why can't you, you know, you cast, you know, a, a bunch of goblins. Why can't goblins appear on the table and then they rush the other person? And I always thought that would be, you know, pretty cool. If you buff them up, they get a little bit bigger. If you do a buff or you do stuff to them, you can do a lot more graphics. It just seems like there's an opportunity there to make online CCG more graphically entertaining. Um, yeah, yeah, you can't do it on the cards, but do more than just put your cards on the screen. It'd be cool if you could actually interact them and 
Magic attempted at one time to take their game and turn it into an online video game. And it did really poorly. I thought it was another good opportunity. And I think that's what like Slay the Spire attempts to do. And they do it a little bit. Well, they do it better than Magic did for sure when they did it. But the whole concept of coming up with a game that runs via your cards and then takes what you did with your cards and turns it into actual actions and i think that's a pretty cool uh, a cool premise uh anyway uh let's see so i'm trying to get back to my my topic here but you know one of the things one has to think about is when they're designing their game you have a idea you have the theme that you want to paste on this idea you know but then you have to start coming up with what are the mechanics going to be. A lot of people want to build, you know, you always have to start from somewhere. And sometimes people say stuff like, I really like deck builders. I'm going to build a deck builder game. And you know what? I want it to be something to do with Pokemon. And, okay, so we already have the decks that people build, but that's not quite the same. It's like, how do you interact that into a board game and make it... Um, make it a game that maybe your Pokemon get stronger over time. So you're building a deck where you're gaining their abilities. Uh, once you have enough, enough cards in their deck, they can, they can level up. Maybe each card is considered their, uh, their level. So at level 25, you have 25 cards in your deck, you can level them up and then you start off with a new, a new deck of slightly better power, slightly higher strengths. And then that would level. And then once you get up another, 30 to 50, depending on the Pokemon. Maybe each one has its own range of, uh, of uh, evolution, which is what the case is with the game. So you're trying to think of how can you make what people know of as Pokemon. And everybody thinks of it as either the uh, old Game Boy games where they're playing the RPG, and or they're thinking of it as the cartoons that were, you know, they watched as a kid. And ultimately, I think everything comes around from the cartoon, but somebody somebody's done a decent enough job of like the rpgs of creating a game world it's video games but nobody's really done a very good pokemon board game ccgs are popular it's a it's a popular game but it doesn't really capture everything that's pokemon i mean you are just fighting but you know a lot of the cartoons were about the traveling around and collecting the pokemon and fighting new bigger pokemon uh trainers and, and bosses and whoever so to conceive that logic and that kind of thing into a board game takes a lot of different uh, approaches to how you come at it. So building a game around a mechanic is might be a starting point, but you never want to lock on to mechanics because a really good game would probably have multiple mechanics in it. I mean, all of the games I know of that really only do one kind of mechanic, you know, just worker placements. I think uh, worker placements give a lot of variety, so there's they can they can have some longevity, but generally it still gets kind of old. It's the same building, same things on the board, and now in order to uh, to make those games better, people have added more tiles. They create more things for the workers to do. Um, and in which case you're now it's still a worker placement, but it's also a tile draw game. It's also a, a, a strategy game where you're putting down, you know, what kind of buildings do you want? It's a, it's a workflow game. So there's, there's a lot of different things and you don't want to tie yourself into one thing. The only things you can really tie into is your theme and you've really got to know your theme. Well, you know, if you've never done a particular, uh, Say you've never watched Lord of the Rings, it's going to be really hard to do a game based on Lord of the Rings. I mean, Lord of the Rings is basically fantasy, so if you've done RPG, you're probably getting pretty close. But if you want it to truly have the look and feel of the movies, of having that growth from uh, your either starting with your Hobbit or your Wizard or whoever it is, you got to know their backstory. You got to know how are they developing? What is it that they do? What are their abilities? So that you, when your game is developing, they grow into that figure based or that character based on your uh, uh, design of the game. Give people that option to build Gandalf like he like he is this 
powerful fighting wizard. You know, he's not just a wizard. He can fight. But, you know, and then you have, uh, what's his face, the white wizard. He He's, you know, a character that is mostly just magic. I don't even know how great a fighter he is, but he has pr pretty amazing uh, magic skills. But he's a bad guy, right? But maybe, you know, you don't have to play him that way. But ultimately, you want to make your game provide for the opportunity to encounter these characters and play against these characters or be those characters in a way that they feel like they're in the movie. And a lot of RPGs have come out, or CCGs, that have tried to accomplish that. Uh, RPGs and video games, you know, you're mostly just the guy driving the outside force. You might be one person and they drive you by putting you into the scenes that you would be fighting in. But a, a game doesn't allow you to allow you to put you into scenes like that. You know, um, you have it has to develop and get you there by way of you doing certain things and meeting certain criteria that the game sets. And then, you know, maybe once you reach certain milestones, new types of monsters come out. Um, how do you travel? You know, uh, it usually becomes a tile placement game. But if you don't know the world of uh, the Lord of the Rings, um, you're not going to be able to create these games. So you got to know your subject matter. And a good game design will take into account everything that the game is and then eventually during what they call the uh, the development phase there's the design phase and then there's the development phase and a lot of companies actually have a game developer and they have a game design person the game design person is the idea guy he's the guy who sits down and goes okay we're gonna do Pokemon game and he starts throwing together all the rules and he starts coming up with great ideas and he lists out all lists them all out and then they take that game and that, then he'll take that game off the times and sell it to a company who set, gives it to their game developer. And that game developer might work with the designer if it's, you know, if they want to have that mutual relationship. And, but ultimately he's going to go through and start hacking at it. He's going to go, no, this is too complicated. Uh, this, this we can't do because of that. Oh, but you know, these two items aren't going to work unless we do this also. So they start hacking it and refining it. Now, if you're a one-man band like myself, you have to be able to both design it and develop your game. You have to be able to go, ah, oh, man, as much as I love this feature, I got to get rid of it. It's not helping the game. It's causing too much slowdown. It's causing too much problems in, my, in the overall game. So you got to be able to give yourself the criticism and understand that it's time to, time to let go of those ideas that you really liked. One of them, like when I come back to the X case, you know, I wanted them to connect like an accordion so that when you pulled them all out, they all faced you and you had this nice cool uh, display that looks, that you can just look at on the table, get to your figures wherever they are, then squish them all back together, lock them up and walk away. Um, I, had to, I had to accept the fact that that was not something we could actually create and put on in, in a injection mold because it's just, just because of the way the features all had to work on the case. So I had to get to the point where I had to give something up. Luckily, with some tweaks, and we got most of it. The only thing I had to give up was there's no accordion effect on the back. When they connect back to back, they lock into each other, and they're just in that position. So if you want them all to face you, you have to disconnect the backs and flip them around. Um, luckily, my, uh, the customers didn't seem to mind that so much. Uh, they were happy enough with the ability to swing them out front to front, disconnect the backs and just display them, um, which was great because that's, <laughs> like it or not, that's what we were getting. Okay, so that's kind of all I wanted to discuss today. I mean, there's other things to talk about, um, you know, addressing your audience. Who, it is, who is it you're trying to get to, uh, considering it, um, if your audience is probably going to be uh, overwhelmed or underwhelmed by what you're putting out there and understanding that some audiences are smaller than others you know if you're approaching uh, football for example you're going to have the issue of there may not be that many football fans out there that are also tabletop game players um, for whatever reason you know there are some but maybe there's not enough maybe that's why some football games don't succeed um you know there's other things to talk about you know we can go in depth on on what complexity is and how to 
and how to resolve complexity, how to learn to reduce that. I'll bring some examples of games that um, I've been working on. Uh, fiddliness, that's one of those abstract terms that different people see different ways on a game, but it's definitely something to consider. Usually comes down to how many components are on the board and how many things you have to do to keep the game moving or set up or whatever. Um, but we'll talk about that stuff in a later later chat. I think 45 minutes is long enough for this and we'll, uh, I'll talk more in the future and hopefully I'll be able to edit this, put some additional uh, graphics up and things to work with uh, when I move it over to a permanent home probably on YouTube. So uh, look for it there in the, in the weeks and months to come. And uh, thanks for taking a look if you are checking this out. And if you do like, you know, um, I, I'd be okay to take some follows and subscribers. Uh, let me know what you think. Thanks. Bye.